Let's talk about floating point numbers. Actually, let's start by talking about fractions. You might remember from grade school, at least I hope you do, that you can write numbers like a third as 0.33333 repeating. And that for any rational number, a number that can be written as p over q, where p and q are integers, we can either write down the number as a finite uh, decimal fraction, so something like 1 quarter equals 0.25, or we can write it down as an infinitely repeating binary fraction, or decimal fraction. In binary, you've got something very similar. For example, 1 over 3 in binary looks like 1 base 2 over 1, 1 base 2, and it becomes 0 0.010101 repeating. That is, we have a 1 in the 1 fourths place, a 1 in the 1 sixteenths place, a 1 in the 1 64ths place, and so on. Now, if you're not comfortable converting binary fractions to decimal fractions in your head, you might note that this is a quarter plus 1 over 4 squared plus 1 over 4 to the third, and so on. So that's a geometric series, uh, except it's got uh, 1 quarter to the 0 lopped off. So that's 1 over 1 minus a quarter minus 1, the term that's lopped off, which is equal to a third. Now, there's an interesting aside here, which is that every rational number can be written as p over q, where q is either a power of 2 or 1 less than a power of 2, an integer power of 2. That's not going to come up at all in the rest of the class, but it's something I've always thought was a curious fact. Now, suppose that we're looking at a number like, say, 0.2 base 10. Right. You can write 0.2 as a finite decimal fraction because it's 2 over 10, or 1 over 5, and 5 is an integer power of 5. In general, if I have x equals p over q, where p and q are relatively prime, and q is a product of an integer power of 2 and an integer power of 5, so uh, only 2 and 5 are allowed as prime factors then I can write down a finite decimal fraction representation of x. Something similar holds for binary, but there the denominator has to be an integer power of 2, no powers of 5 allowed. So for example, 0 0.2 in decimal is 0 0.00110011 repeating in binary. Now why is that significant? What that means is that things that you write down in decimal exactly cannot necessarily be written down exactly as binary fractions. So 2 tenths is a good example. If you write down 0.2 in MATLAB or in another computer program that's using binary floating point behind the scenes, the representation that the computer stores is not exactly 0.2. It's rounded by a little bit to fit into a finite number of binary digits. So what does the representation the computer uses actually look like? Well, it's a binary representation, and it's essentially scientific notation. So you've got sine, which is plus or minus 1. We write that as minus 1 to the s, where s is 0 or 1, times 1 point bit, 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 bit. If we're using double precision, which will be our default, uh, that has 52 bits after the binary point times 2 to the e, where e is some exponent between minus 1,022 and plus 1,023. Now, there's 11 bits that are actually used to store the exponent, and those of you who are paying attention may have noticed that we've used in that exponent range 2,046 of the possible 2,048 combinations. That's because the exponents corresponding to all zero bits and all one bits, so uh, in double precision, that's uh, the minus 1,023 and plus 1,024 representations, if you like. Uh, those are used to represent special values. So what special values are those? Well, look at the representation of normalized numbers for a moment. There's a very important number that you can't represent as a normalized floating point number, namely 0. And it would be nice to have 0 as something in our floating point system. So we need to have that. The other thing is, this is a finite 
range of representations that are possible. So things that are bigger than, say, 2 to the 1024 have to have a representation too. So what we're going to do is reserve the exponent field of all zeros to mean we're looking at subnormal numbers. So those are numbers that can be written as plus or minus 0 point bit 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 times 2 to the 1 minus bias, so 2 to the minus 1022 for double precision. So if all of the bits are 0, this gives us plus or minus 0. Otherwise, it gives us a bunch of other numbers that fill in the gap between the smallest normalized positive number and the smallest normalized negative number, smallest in magnitude. So those are important. Those are called the subnormal numbers. What about the value of the exponent being all 1 bits? Well, that can mean one of two things. It can either mean that you're representing plus or minus infinity, or you're representing not a number. Not a number is what happens when, for example, you try to divide 0 by 0. Let me denote by fl of x the correctly rounded floating point representation of a real number x. So I give you a real number, fl of x is the closest thing that I can get in floating point. Now, the definition of closest thing I can get in floating point is a little bit context dependent. By default, that means we round to the nearest even floating point number. So if there's a tie, we round to a floating point number that has zero as the last bit. If there's not a tie, we just round to the nearest floating point number. The exception, of course, is numbers that are too big to be represented in the system, and those we round to infinity. So too big in the context of double precision is a little bit more to the 10 to, than 10 to the 308th power. So if you are regularly using values that are larger than 10 to the 308th, uh, this is something that you need to be aware of. If not, you may need to be aware of it anyhow occasionally, but most of the time it's something that we can ignore. Double precision has a pretty ample exponent range. Now the basic rule of floating point arithmetic is that for simple operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square root, the floating point system returns the true result correctly rounded to the nearest floating point number. So if I write in a computer program C equals A plus B and my environment satisfies the demands of IEEE 754 floating point standard, then the value of C that I get at the end of that is going to be equal to FL of the true value of A plus B. Now there are a couple exceptions you need to know about. If I try to do something like compute 0 divided by 0, I get not a number out of the floating point system. If I generate something that's too big, as I mentioned before, I get an infinity. And if I generate something that's smaller than the normalized number, this rule still holds, but we're going to lose some digits of accuracy when we start reasoning about uh, uh, the relative error. And that's something we'll talk about more in the next lecture. Now there are ways in which floating point arithmetic clearly does not behave like the arithmetic of real numbers. Uh, the simplest one is results aren't exact, um, but there are others as well. And exceptions are uh, the computer's way of telling us that what we've done differs from true real arithmetic. So. The simplest exception, which happens so often that most people don't even know that it exists, is inexact. That means that something has been stored which was not exactly representable in floating point. Underflow means that a subnormal number was generated, something that was too small to be represented by normalized numbers. Overflow means we generated something that was too large to be represented by normalized numbers. Invalid means we did something like 0 divided by 0 or square root of minus 1 if we're dealing with real arithmetic. That generates not a number. And divide by 0 is the generation of an exact infinity. So underlike, unlike overflow, these are generated by expressions that 
in the extended real numbers would actually give you an infinity. So 1 divided by 0 is an example, or log of 0 is another example. Now, the details of the floating point system do matter sometimes, which is why we've gone through them however quickly. Fortunately, most of the time we can ignore the complexities of floating point and instead reason about error analysis in terms of a very simple model. And that's what we'll talk about next time.